So often, um, when we tell the Christmas story, from Luke especially, uh, we kind of romanticize it. We have this image, and it's all, um, it's peaceful, it's calm, it's, it's nice. It kind of looks like someplace you want to be. But, but really, the circumstances surrounding this whole thing um, are unexpected. They do not really fit uh, what's going on. And as I was reflecting on this um, this week, I was just I was just thinking. I don't I don't know exactly how it works in heaven, how much the angels know and don't know. Um, but as I was kind of reflecting on this, I, I kind of imagine uh, an angel who uh, finds out he's been called to the throne room, and um, They've been told there's rumors it's time for the Messiah to come, and uh, he gets to be the one uh, to go and announce. And I, I can just imagine in my head the angel coming before the throne of thrones and the God of gods, and just like, um, thank you. Thank you that you're going to give me this opportunity to go announce the Messiah. I am just so excited to get the details. Is it, is it uh, Herod that you want me to go to? Or maybe Caesar himself or the, the Sanhedrin, possibly. I, I, I will go anywhere. Who do you want me to go to? And the Lord of Lords says, I have some shepherds to send you to. And I can imagine the angel going, oh, shepherds. Then who? <laughs> That's it. Just wants you to go tell the shepherds. Are they special shepherds? Is there a, you know, a spiritual shepherd group? I don't know. No. They're just shepherds in the field watching sheep. Okay, you're God. Not a problem. I'll go tell them, right? What's the message? You know, God starts with the, with the whole, you know, goodwill to man and peace on earth. And he's like, man, that's a great message. I'll tell him that message. All right. Uh, he says, well, you can also have to let him know where, where the Messiah is. Oh, yes. That's exciting. What, what, where, where is he? Which, which is, it, is, it, is it in the main, is it in the main house in Jerusalem? Is it, is it, is it there? Or maybe that's too ostentatious. Maybe, maybe it's, it's the, the chief priest. Maybe it's at, at his home. And the father says, no, tell them that they're going to find the Christ child in a stable. Is your definition of stable and my definition of the stable the same? We're talking about were the animals. Yeah. Tell them that they will find the Christ child in a stable and they'll know that it's the child because he'll be lying in the feed trough. The feed trough. You know, I could zip down and put something together real quick, a little better. <laughs> no. Do you, do you, I mean, do, I mean, do you want me to take some kind of gift, maybe a small fire in the corner of the stable? No, I got the gift thing taken care of. I'm sending three guys, they're, they're leaving now. Now, yes. You realize the trip from the east to where Jesus is will take away over a year to get there. I got it. Got it covered. And they're bringing the gifts. Yes, gold, frankincense, myrrh. That's great, but that's not really helpful for a baby. Maybe there's something I could take. He says, actually, when they arrive, I do have a couple messages for you. Great! What do you want me to say? Don't go back to Herod. And then tell Joseph and Mary to get out of there. Because they're coming to kill him. And I can imagine this angel going, this is a joke, right? Is Jesus behind the curtain over there? Are you trying to put a fast one on me? Jesus, come out! No. It's, it, it, it is not what any of us would imagine. And other than maybe the Father, it catches everyone by surprise. Especially these lowly shepherds. And as I kind of think about this, I, I believe this is a common experience in life, especially during the season of the holidays. Our expectations of how it should be 
and the reality of how things are don't match up. And this is actually the story behind today's carol, the one we sang, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. This carol is actually based on the uh, poem written in 1863 by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Some of you may remember from way back when in your studies, he's one of uh, America's most famous poets. He, um, uh, his lifespan from 1807 to 1882, uh, he was a poet and an educator. He wrote, his works include things like Paul Revere's Ride, the Song of Hiawatha, Evangeline. He also, by the way, was the first American, not first ever, but first American um, to translate Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy. And he was one of the five fireside poets from New England. He was so renowned. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow is the only American who has a statue, a bust, uh, at Westminster Abbey in England. In 1936, when he was just getting going as a young poet, he married a young lady. And shortly thereafter, uh, she was with birth with their first child, and there was complications. And she died six months after a miscarriage. She was only 22 years old. Shortly after that, Henry um, Wadsworth Longfellow had his eye on a young lady by the name of Fanny. You see a picture of her with her kids here. He courted her for seven years before she finally agreed to marry him. They had been married for 18 years when just two years before the writing of this poem in 1861, Longfellow's personal peace was shaken. Fanny came crashing into the den where he was taking a nap and she was on fire. Some hour her hoop dress had been lit and just went up and he did his best to put out the fire first with a rug and then his own body. But unfortunately it was not enough. And the next day, she died. Longfellow's facial burns himself were so bad that he was unable even to attend his own wife's funeral. And that famous beard that we're all familiar with, he would grow to hide those burns. His grief was so great that he was afraid that at times they were going to send him to an asylum. Then two years later, in 1863, during the American Civil War, his oldest son, Charles, pictured here, joined the Union cause as a soldier without his father's blessing. As a matter of fact, Longfellow would learn of this by a letter in March of that year, where Charles says, I have tried hard to resist the temptation of going without your leave, but I cannot any longer. I feel it to be my first duty to do what I can for my country, and I would willingly lay down my life for it, it would, if it would be of any good. In November of that year, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was informed that his son Charlie had been shot through the left shoulder, and the bullet had exited under his right shoulder blade. It had traveled across his back and seemed to have skimmed his spine and was told he probably would be paralyzed from then on. He rushed to Washington at the end of November, getting there in early December to be with his son. And then barely a month later after receiving that news, on Christmas Day, Christmas Day, 1863, Longfellow, pictured here, a 57-year-old widow father of six children, the oldest of which it seemed had been paralyzed by serving his country, wrote a poem. A poem that sought to capture the dynamic and the dissonance around him. He heard the Christmas bells that December day and the singing of peace on earth as reflected in a book that he held dear, the Bible, from Luke chapter 2. 
But then he observed the world of injustice and violence that seemed to mock the truthfulness of this optimistic outlook. And then he penned a poem, which is what our carol is based on. And here it is, the poem, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. He writes, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. The spirit of the Christmas bells, he understood, was that angelic announcement of goodwill toward men, good angelic announcement of peace on earth, that angelic announcement that God favors mankind. It was something that was familiar. It was something that, was, that usually was warm and wonderful. And he goes on and writes in his poem, and, and thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing and singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. His description is the spirit of Christmas celebrated throughout the land. But in that moment, there was a stark contrast of the celebration of what he known. And he goes on to write, Then from each black accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south. And with the sound, the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. The reality was there was a savage civil war going on, cannons raging in the south on the very day that the bells were ringing and it was beginning to drown out the sound. He writes, it was as if an earthquake rent the hearthstones of a continent and made forlorn the households born of peace on earth, goodwill to men. His feeling of merriment had turned to sadness in the wake of the reality around him. And here is how he describes his feelings. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. In this moment, his circumstances overcome him. His feelings overwhelm him. And for a moment, he gives in to despair. For a moment, he gives in to the reality around him, the reality of his life, the reality of lost love, the reality of the unfairness of the world. And he despairs. But the bells kept ringing. And the angels kept proclaiming their message. And his last, he says, Then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. And it is common in this day and time where pain was a reality. They didn't have Advil. They didn't have the medical science that we did. They didn't have social security Pain was a reality. And like so many of the writers of this time, they reflected the Psalms, which start out in despair, which start out, why God? Which start out with the reality, I, I am under it. I want to give up. How can this be? But end with, but God, I know who you are. I know what you can do. And I know what you will do. And I choose to trust you. And that, of course, is a theme for today. If you've kind of picked it up by now. 
trust. Webster calls or defines trust as assured reliance on the character, ability, strength, or truth of someone or something. It's dependence on something future. It is the essence of hope. In my mind's eye, the, the best example of trust has always been the kid standing on the edge of the pool the very first time. And mom or dad or someone really close to them going, jump, sweetie, jump. And the kid looks and says, the water is deep. It's above my head. And I found out in the bathtub that stuff goes down the wrong pipe. It ain't a good thing. It looks like sure death or pain to me. But then they get their eyes, if you would, like Peter off of the waves and back onto the one, on the mom or dad. And you know what? They know mom and dad love them. They're sure to their character. They're sure to their ability. How they throw me up and they, they catch me and they whisk me away. They know their strength and they know that they can be trusted. And, and they depend on that future, that hope. And so they show trust. And despite the vastness and how scared they are, they leap into the arms of the one they trust. That is what trust is. And so that leaves us, I believe, with a question for this morning. Do you trust God? Do you trust God? Because really that makes the difference on how you react to the world around you when it goes crazy. And let's face it, it's going crazy. At the same time that we have the, the beautiful lights and the bells ringing and the, and the, the uh, signs up saying peace on earth or, or love everyone, at the same time we got countries at war maybe even nuclear war. We have a, a divide in our country in, in, in politics, a divide in our, our country in race, a divide in our country in gender. Everywhere we look around us, the world is crumbling. Even though we're hiring, hiding as best we can in our Bay Area bubble. And you can be overwhelmed by despair or you can trust God, which leads to hope. And I think in answering this question, do you trust God, there's actually three individual questions within it. The first question would be, do you trust that God is good, that he's a good God? Because if, if, you, if you don't believe that he's a good God, if you, if you don't believe it inherently, you know, that he's the kind of God that, that if you jump to him in the pool, it's like it's a 50-50 chance whether or not he'll catch you. If you don't believe he's a good God all the time, you ain't going to jump, and there's not much hope. Do you believe what the psalmist writes when he writes in Psalm 106? Praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord. Why? For He is good, and His love endures forever. In other words, it is nonstop. Do you believe in spite of the world around you, your circumstances, that God is inherently good all the time? Do you truly believe that there is, there is no bad in God, that the bad that it's caused is, is caused by our own choices, by the brokenness of the world, not by God, because He is good all the time? Do you believe that? And if you believe that, I think you have to ask the second question, do you trust that He works all things to the good for His children? Not only is he a good God, but do you believe that he specially has good things, that he'll take all things and work it for the good for his kids? Paul, in writing to the church in Rome, in the midst of some hard times, says this, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now what this passage is not saying is that uh, God is a happily ever after God. Once you have God, it all works out. The evil witch is taken care of. The castle never gets cold. You're, you, know, you give birth to little princes and princesses, and you live happily ever after. That, that, that's definitely not in the Bible. 
not at least until evil is completely taken care of and we're made anew again. But in this day and time, in this age of fallen humanity, which is why Jesus needed to come in the first place, that is not what he's saying. What he does mean is this. God will take your bad choices, my bad choices. He'll take our stupidity that we have caused ourselves and use it for good. What it does mean is that God will take the stupidity and the evil of others in your life that you're a victim of, that you may or may not have deserved, those wounds, that brokenness, that injustice, and he can use that for good. What it does mean is as the world goes crazy and everybody else is unsure of the, of the market, of the security of their family, of the security of their country, of the security of their life, we can stand strong because God will use even those disasters, natural disasters, the burning down of our own home maybe. He can use that for good in our lives. Do you trust him? That he gives good gifts and will turn, not, not always, 100% all the time you will experience, but he'll turn the bad in your life. He'll use the bad in your life, even when you're responsible for it, to good. Do you believe that? Now, here's the thing. I think a lot of people, especially folks that are sitting here today, they believe, we believe God is good. And we believe that God gives good gifts to his kids. The hard thing is whether or not we believe we're one of his kids. If we're worthy of that. Which leads me to the third question. Do you trust God's grace in your life? Do you trust that he takes you as you are? Do you trust the work that Jesus did on the cross that you cannot, nor will you ever be able to do on your own. Earlier in that same book of Romans, that same chapter 8, Paul writes, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. He says, you didn't receive the, the a spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, where you're right back at square one. What was square one? Square one is that you were going to be judged on your own actions according to how well you fo follow the rules. And so you're always fearful because why? Because we always mess up. We always want to do one thing. We end up doing another. He says, you're no longer in bondage to that. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live by that rule anymore because no longer is the relationship the judge and the servant. There's a new relationship in town, if you would. It's the one that's in the spirit of adoption. And I love this, especially since my wife and I, we adopted our kids. And I can tell you, we love them as much. We hold them as dear as much as if they, we gave birth to them ourselves. And he says, this is, the, this is the new thing. You are God's kid. He took you just as you are. He adopted you. And he says, and now, therefore, rather than saying, have mercy, God. Don't judge me, God. I'm scared, God. Now we get to cry out, Abba, Father, translated in modernity, Daddy. While everybody else is waiting in line to see him, while everybody else is hoping he'll show them favor, you can go right, right to the front of the line and go, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. Do you trust that? Do you trust his goodness isn't a question of you deserving it, but the fact that you have a good father who just wants to give you good things despite yourself or despite your background? Maybe like the first Christmas with the shepherds, the circumstances of your life don't match the spirit of the season. I know it's true for many people in this room. You may find yourself feeling alone, poor, rejected, or destitute. All the Christmas cheer seems in stark contrast to your reality, even what's going on in church. Will you give in to despair? The reality that things are tough. The reality that you're in a bind. Or would you trust in the unshakable character of a good daddy, of your God? As the worship team comes up, I want to leave you with this reminder 
from the end of that chapter, Romans chapter 8. Paul writes this. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? That isn't a great list there, y'all. As it is written, and he quotes the Hebrew scriptures, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And then he says this, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Jesus who loved us. More than conquerors. We're more than conquerors in trouble. We're more than conquerors in hardship. We're more than conquerors in persecution or famine. We're more than conquerors in nakedness or danger or war. We are more than conquerors. Not because those things aren't true, but because God's love for us is unwavering. And then he ends with this. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, including yourself, by the way, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. If your hope has waned and despair is taking hold, first of all, you're not alone. You're not alone. That, that, there's nothing weird or you're not anti-normal. Welcome to the club. We've all been there at some point. I would invite you to renew your trust today. For God is good. And His favor, despite your feelings, despite your circumstances, His favor does rest on you. You just need to choose to trust this truth and let hope take hold.